Who shot J.R.? Some of you that may, for some of you that may resonate, 30 years ago it was a question that captivated television viewers across America for an entire summer. And the answer could be viewed pretty much in one place on the CBS television network during primetime, November 21st, 1980. Now today, if such a cliffhanger captured the imagination of TV viewers, the months leading up to the answer would be filled with entertainment. Clues from earlier episodes would be downloaded in Istanbul. There would be JR social networking games in Japan. The pivotal episode would be aired live in Abu Dhabi. It would be TiVo'd and tweeted by millions around the globe, viewed live on mobile screens, and lampooned by amateur filmmakers on YouTube. And the show that featured J.R. Ewing, Dallas, which you may recall, would have one beautifully designed website, and it would be well visited, full of eyeballs, and all of those eyeballs and all of those platforms would need to be turned into profits. So it's a pleasure and honor for me to be here today in this exciting region of the world and certainly in this visionary country and most of all before this distinguished audience uh, of extraordinary media professionals. More than ever, TV is the world's most powerful medium and it keeps growing. Where is it all headed and what are the opportunities and what are the risks? To explore those questions, we're fortunate to have one of the most distinguished panels of international television executives ever assembled. Robert M. Bakish is president of Viacom's MTV Networks International. He oversees all MTV Networks operations outside of the U.S., and that includes MTV, Nickelodeon, Comedy Central. He's responsible for programming in more than 600 million households in 162 countries, 33 languages, 175 channels, 429 websites, and 43 mobile TV services. Please welcome Bob Bakish. <laughs> Raul Ravarado joined France Telecom in 94 and has headed up the Convergent Solutions product line, the Orange Business Services, and has served as, as Chief of Staff to France Telecom's Chairman and CEO, Didier Lombard. For the last two years, he has been Executive Vice President in charge of new growth businesses and transformation at Orange, which has 192 million subscribers in 29 countries. Welcome, Raul Ravarado. <laughs> and next, there is indeed proof that great journalists can be great business people. Dr. Pranoy Roy is executive chairman and co-owner, along with his wife, Radhika, who is a journalist, of NDTV, New Delhi Television. Dr. Roy operates three 24-hour nationwide Indian news channels, anchors the 9 o'clock news, and presents coverage of special live events. He is a cephologist, an expert in elections and electoral behavior. Please welcome Dr. Roy. And though Doan's chairman, unfortunately, Mehmet Ali Alshinda had to leave last night unexpectedly, we are most fortunate to have Nuri Cholakolu, president of Doan Media International. Doan is a media powerhouse in Turkey controlling almost 50% of the country's media from newspapers to magazines to television, radio, and the web. Let's thank and welcome Nuri Cholakolu. I think, um, you know, there's probably no better place to start. We talk about how much television has changed. And for me, and I think for many people here, we can remember the days of television being derisively referred to as the idiot box. And it was this passive form of entertainment, totally passive. And uh, the networks who controlled this this uh, very scarce media sort of raked in the dough. So I think there's probably 
no better place to start than let's talk and let's define what is television today and more importantly, how are you guys making money and how will you continue to make money from it? Bob? Thank you. Well, television is obviously, you know, that's a big question. Um, and, and it's certainly a, um, an evolving question. I mean, we operate, as you heard, feeds around the world um, under multiple brands to serve multiple demographics. And you know, I like to think of our business as a, a word we call global, part global, part local. And um, you know, part of serving our demographics, whether it's young adults through MTV, kids and family through Nickelodeon, um, more on the adult side with Comedy Central, is about creating a compelling uh, entertainment experience. Um, starting with a backbone slate of international programming and then delivering it in a locally appropriate way through presentation, language, and ultimately wrapping it with local production and programming um, of varying amounts based on, on you know, sort of the market-specific situation. Um, so that's what we're all about. And today, you know, that's not just about the sort of analog linear screen you talked about in the days of who shot JR when, quite frankly, life was a lot simpler. I actually remember that episode, yes, yes. although it was a couple of years ago. Um, but that was a world where there were three broadcast networks. Each had roughly, I don't know, one-third share. Uh, and they probably literally did mint money. You know, today, you know, we grew up in multi-channel, obviously. Um, and we were, you know, for a long time, uh, the upstarts. Um, and today, we live in even a far more complex world, in a 360 world, where we're dealing with digital feeds delivered to wired devices, i.e. web devices, mobile devices. Um, and we you know, work to put them together and market them, by the way, to create a compelling experience for our end consumers and ultimately for our uh, relevant constituencies, be them multi-channel distributors, be them advertisers, be, their, be them consumer products licensees. Um, and sometimes we do that on an own basis, sometimes we do on a license basis. So it's actually a big and complex question and, you know, one, we spend obviously a lot of time on it and we enjoy working on it. Yes. Raul, now, how about taking a stab at that? Because you're involved, obviously, in new platforms and, and uh, television on various screens. What, what, what is TV today for a company like yours? First and foremost, uh, TV is what our clients want. Uh, when they buy uh, uh, an, uh, an access service from Orange, they want TV. So we sell TV packages. We have three million IPTV uh, customers. We sell a uh, million and a half uh, pay TV packages. So that's traditional pay TV. We edited channels, uh, six channels, sports and cinema and series channels that are completely interactive on internet, mobile, and, uh, and the IPTV, of course, where customers can play their, um, watch their shows whenever they want on which, whichever device, which is quite successful. So that's a, a, a pay TV model. We're also making money on the mobile. Uh, we have uh, uh, 3 million repeat uh, users of, uh, of televisions on the mobile, and we charge them for that. Uh, we, our customers downloaded 140 million videos last year on the mobile, so that's quite successful. And then on the internet piece, uh, we also are serving our clients with video and TV over the internet. We have 60 million unique visitors on our portals worldwide, and we have uh, about 2 million uh, unique visitors on our video part uh, of this. And then we make money out of advertising, uh, interactive advertising on the television, inter interactive advertising on the mobile, and interactive advertising uh, on the IPTV and on the internet as well. So it's a pay TV model, uh, it's a uh, uh, usage-based access model, and it's an advertising model. Now, there was a, a, a time when major, a major advertiser, and, and I want Dr. Roy and Nuri to, to also address this question, but let's broaden it a little bit and look at it in this context. A major, major advertiser, Procter & Gamble, for example, as Bob was pointing out, the share was so incredible on network television. That advertiser could buy or place an ad on those three major networks and pretty much reach, you know, 70, 75 percent. Of, of, of the viewing public. So now, within the, these new definitions of television, how do you make money? How do we make money going forward? What are the opportunities for people here? Well, as you rightly indicated, not many people would remember that only 30 years ago, the television was only primetime television, and daytime and morning television was out. 
and uh, television was a permanent fixture of your living room, which you turn on when you walk into your living room and turn it off when you're going to the bedroom. And that was the time when the great programmers decided what time, who watches what, and when. Even the, cord, uh, the commercial breaks were coordinated that's so that no one can escape it. But today we are witnessing a, a process which I call the democratization of television. Now, in, for example, in my country, uh, there are about two satellite channels which uh, offer up to 300 different channels to any subscriber who is willing to pay something around the vicinity of 20 euros or $30 a month. And then uh, in your couch with your small uh, remote control, you can decide when you want to watch where. This is the biggest problem which we indicated as Ed Arts of Procter & Gamble has indicated that where the money is, how to get to the people, how to, and also the, the greatest difficulty of uh, mainstream television, that's not, which is not the pay TV, is we're doing a double marketing act. First, we have to come up with a creative content that would appeal to large segments of the society, make them watch that, and then when we establish that certain number of people are watching that program, then we turn around and start doing a second marketing to those bunch of people whom we call the advertisers and try to sell them that these are the people who you really need to reach out if you want to sell your products. So <clears throat> this is a weird juggling act we are trying to find and therefore we have to multiply. In the past, we used to do one single channel and fit into that everything from children to game shows to talk shows to classical music to pop music, everything on one single street. And now we have, we are opening up loads of streets and the technology, of course, is helping us to increase the amount of channels we are managing. Right now, for example, in Turkey, Doğan is uh, running two of the top four popular channels along with some 20 thematic channels which we produce ourselves and there are about some 40 different channels which we buy from other people like Animal Planet, National Geographic, which we try to sell. So we are offering a large bunch of selection to the likes of the people, not one single channel, but trying to catch every, it's like selling cigarettes. I mean, when you're producing cigarettes, you don't create one brand. We try to create several brands to catch different segments of the consumer so that you can optimize your money and try to make things meet at the end. Sure, and then of course you talk about that dual process of creating the content and then having to turn around and market it. The big gamble, the big challenge is that you invest incredibly up front. You don't know whether or not you will actually create something. That there's an interest in downstream and of course you don't get a return on your investment oftentimes until very far downstream. When I was uh, very young in this business, I met a guy in Los Angeles uh, who told me about a 100% rule. Uh, in Hollywood, you start making a film, you're absolutely sure that it's 100% is going to make the box office and it's going to bring you lots of bucks. <laughs> and that is usually ends up as a flop. And then a small budget film which you do it for one reason or the other because the artist has insisted or because the director has pushed on to you, which you don't know how to put and where to put that, that comes out as a major success and that's the thing which really brings in the money. Sure. So uh, when you're addressing the likes of the people, which is a very unpredictable thing, even someone like Prenner Roy, who's an expert on audience research, etc., cannot have uh, absolutely sure of which is going to sell, what is not going to sell. Right. And, and, and Dr. Roy Nuri mentioned democratization. And boy, you talk about democratization having an impact on a market. Everyone now, all the big global media players would love to be if they are not already in India. They see this tremendous growth in advertising, potential growth. There's such scalability there. Talk about that market and, 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 and why it's so attractive. And then also, what do the local, the, the lo, what does a local homegrown 
um, management and creative community, what impact, what level of competition does it present also? Well, I'd say in India, uh, taking off from what Rupert Murdoch said last night, uh, we have actually perhaps, if you can have such a thing, a surfeit of cr creativity. Uh, we've had six years of democracy, so all our kids have democracy and questioning and arguing with us, which is really annoying in their DNA. Uh, they don't take anything that, they do the opposite of what you say. Uh, so it's just, it is a beautiful, chaotic anarchy of creativity. And uh, it's a great place to be in the media. But it's also very challenging to keep pace with the change. India is changing dramatically. For 40 years, we grew at only about 2 to 3% a year. Suddenly, in the last 10 years, we're growing at 9, 10% a year, 8 to 10% a year. And it looks like we'll grow at 8 to 10% for the next 20 years. So it's a whole new India. And uh, all of us are trying to understand how does, one, how does one keep up with that change and adjust to it. For example, in that change, you have 50 news channels, you have 400 other channels, you have mobile phones growing at 7 million a month, uh, you have literacy, which is adding 30 million people every month to the market for newspapers, and about 25 million every, every year, 25 million, 30 million every year for newspapers, and 25 million people every year for television. So it's, a, it's a, just a sea change. <laughs> And we're trying to get used to it like, like our politicians are trying to get used to it because for the first 40 years, f four out of five of them used to be voted back into power. In the last 20 years, four out of five are thrown out. So they just don't know what's happening. It's a, just a, a dramatic change in India. Um, mm -hmm. I remember reporting once uh, about 20, 25 years ago from China when the first McDonald's arrived. And it was on a crossroads. And there's a McDonald's there and a huge hoarding with Deng Xiaoping's hand like this sort of blessing uh, the first McDonald's. Now there are what, 2,500 McDonald's? Yes. We're, we're sort of at one now and 20 years from now we'll be at 2,500. So uh, it, what we are trying to cope with is dramatic change in our society. Nuri mentioned to me outside the room that in Turkey there are 15 24-hour news outlets, and you just said 50, 50 news yeah. outlets, which which is mind-boggling that there that there are that many news outlets, and obviously there is tremendous interest from the global media companies. To what extent are they involved in partnerships in India? Well, they're uh, deeply involved in in partnerships in most areas of media, but there are restrictions in news where they're only allowed up to 26% holding because of uh, where the government feels you should keep control of your news media. I don't know if that's right or wrong. But the, 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 why we have 50 is that in the last five years, barriers to entry into television have dropped by 90%. It's now costs you 10% of what it used to cost you five years or six years ago to start a news channel. For example, Satellites used to cost rent of $300 million, $300 million a year. Now it is, sorry, sorry, $3 million a year. Now it's $300,000 a year. So it's down 90%. Cameras are down 90%. Edit suites are down 90%. So technologically, the investment needed is not much, which is a disadvantage for foreigners trying to come in. Earlier, they used to be welcome because they had the capital. Now you don't need that much capital. What you do need now is Creativity, you need a good brand, and you need credibility. Hmm. Because anybody can start a TV channel, and if it's 10% what it was five years ago, five years from now it could be like almost nothing, almost like an in starting an internet uh, website. Bob, you guys, uh, yeah, I, I definitely want to go to you guys that obviously have a presence in India. Right. And you talk about global distribution, you're like ex exhibit one. How, how has MTV been able to, 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 to do this, build such a tremendous global distribution network? Well, well, I think the answer is relatively simple at a high level, but extraordinarily complex at a detailed level, like most things in international business. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, and it ties back to your question on, on ultimately how do we make money on all this stuff, 
Fundamentally, what you have to do, and this sounds corny, but you have to make stuff that people want to, we used to say watch, now we say spend time, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the core. And, and as Dr. Roy says, fundamentally, the ability for people to create stuff is only increasing. Now, I remember a time five years ago or so, we were talking about the sort of value and the, the potential of what we called, you know, the unsigned um, artists um, sort of area in music, and this was going to be a huge you know, area of activity, and, and you know, we and a lot of other people were very excited about it. When you sifted back from it, what you found out is the reason most bands weren't signed was they weren't very good. Hmm, right. And so, you know, ultimately, as Dr. Ray said, it's about have a brand, because brand helps people filter choices in a sea of choice, which is only getting more fragmented. And then make sure that what you attach to that brand is ultimately compelling. That's not to say everything you create, create is compelling, because you've got to create risks and you know, ultimately good ideas come from a variety of places. But fundamentally, what you have to have is a portfolio of bets out there, and you have to make sure some of that stuff is connecting. Because if you get stuff, or when you get stuff that ultimately connects with audiences, you can quote unquote monetize it, you can prosper. And part of what we're you know, focused on is, is having the, um, you know, the great fortune of operating in so many different places around the world. It allows us to have a certain sort of scale bet in general and then supplement that with you know, unique things from around the world, which by the way, ultimately, not as a rule, but have the, uh, the opportunity to travel. Right. You know? and, uh, but ultimately, it sounds simple, it's about the hits. You've got to have hits. I can Contest. tell you a story about MTV in India. It's a great example. When they came to India first, they would play basically Western music. Yeah. And everybody kept saying, you've got to change, and they wouldn't change. Then they kept their production values at international levels, but switched to Bollywood, and they took off. Uh, it's just been a remarkable change. So everybody who comes to India has to localize. And you guys are really among the first to do that around the world, the, the Western media companies to really start programming more localized yeah. content. Right, and I think we were fortunate, particularly on the MTV side, and again, we're not only MTV, we're Nickelodeon, we're Comedy Central, but on the MTV side, because of the nature of the genre was, if you will, music video, you had the ability to start up television networks relatively inexpensively. So we took advantage of that and, and planted the flag pretty much everywhere mm -hmm. and allowed people to create um, as you said, it started with the U.S. Rock and Roll Channel, and we, we, I won't even say quickly, but we eventually figured out that wasn't really the right answer, that it had to be much more localized, and, you know, we're, so we're, we're Bollywood in, in India, and we're a little bit more, you know, sort of hard rock and electronic in Germany, et cetera. But, but ultimately, we had the opportunity to do it because the economics of it worked. And then as we built out that infrastructure, we could, you know, add local programming and, and, and other things to take it to the next level. But, um, but I think, you know, that was a key catalyst. Sure, yeah. And in the beginning of 90s, uh, there was the maxim, think global, act local. I think uh, what MTV had been doing uh, is a very successful example of exactly that. And it also meets the two criteria put forward by Pranoy. Uh, you need a good brand, which is an MTV and uh, creativity, which is turning it around to accommodate the local taste. And this is, for example, what we have done in Turkey as well. I mean, we, we are doing the CNN Turk, uh, which is a Turkish version of CNN. Uh, it's the first CNN subsidiary in, uh, abroad. And it's doing very well because other than CNN, uh, we don't have anything to do with mm -hmm, CNN mm -hmm. because we're accommodating the Turkish likes, Turkish interests in the news. We are, of course, getting logistic support from CNN in international events, but uh, all in all, the, in the heart of the matter, it is a very Turkish uh, operation. And we repeated that, that in Turkey we have a very successful mainstream channel, Kanal D, which is doing marvelously well for the last two years. It's a market leader. And then three years ago, we started a Greenfields investment in Romania, and we created Canal de Romania, which is nothing to do with the Canal de, except for showing some of the Turkish series which had been successful on the Turkish market, which went down well in the Romanian market as well. But other than that, Canal de Romania, except for the brand, everything is Romanian, nothing to do with the Turkish uh, sister. I mean, this is exactly what yeah. one ought to be doing. Raul, you guys have 
all of these broadband customers, you've got fixed broadband customers, you have IPTV customers. Talk about how you take this content and, and, and what are the opportunities on, on new connected screens, on mobile, or on, the, on Apple's new tablet? Yeah. I think that what's happening is that um, now you can connect to, with the television in a box. Uh, you, you could reach out to uh, many people, but you didn't know who was watching and uh, you know where they were, but you didn't know what, who was watching. Now with all those screens that are connected, the mobile, the iPhone, the iPad, the, the, the mobile phones, the screens in the hospitals, the screens in the buses, that are all connected. Now you can, you can speak with your viewer all day long and uh, in different situations. So when you're in a bus, you don't want to do the same thing than when you're lying in your hospital bed or in your own bedroom uh, on your iPad. But you, you can reach out to your customers on a one-by-one -one basis because we, you can identify who's watching you. You can, uh, you can know who, what the profile is. So you can have conversations uh, with your viewer throughout the day on all those screens. And this is very important for the, for the content creators who can invent new ways of building their stories or making their life even when the show is not on, t uh, on air. Um, so that's for the content creators, it's a huge opportunity. And we're trying to, in, in all the countries that we're present with different networks, we're trying to, to, uh, to help the cre content creators to invent new ways of uh, entertaining using those different uh, networks and the interactivity they enable. And for the advertisers, they can also ride with content creators to reach out to, to clients on a one-by-one -one basis. So it's like mass, it's, it's not mass media, it's uh, mass customized media, mass personal media, where you can have conversations with people, uh, with your viewer, with your customer, throughout the day with content or with your brand, uh, day in, day out. And this is what we're trying to do, uh, bringing all those, connecting all those screens with the same platforms so that you can distribute the content in different formats, but with the same uh, story, if you will, and same way with, uh, with the brands. You know, I, last week at uh, the cable convention in Brussels, I heard Mike Fries, the, the CEO of Liberty Global, talk, and the discussion was on, uh, or part of the topic was set-top boxes, and he said, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think people want to do that much work when they turn the television on. These, these interactive services that you're obviously very involved in, in developing, to what extent are they enriching the experience of, of television? In fact, it's true that when you light up your television, you want to relax and you want this laid back, uh, instead of a lean forward, you want a laid back experience. Um, but we have the experience of um, launching our, inter our six interactive television channels, and we find that 50% of our clients watch their content in an interactive fashion. So instead of, we have a linear channel with the, ser the shows and the movies that are showing, but 50% of our clients choose to, to watch them uh, in an interactive fashion. So the thing is, you, you want to be able to, to be laid back and relax, but at the same time, if you're given the opportunity in the right way to have access to what you want when you want it, uh, then, you, then you just do that. So that's for the television, the box itself, when you're in your, uh, in your chair in, uh, in, your, uh, in your living room. But then, you want to know what's happening uh, in your series, but your series doesn't have to stop when the, when the show stops, uh, when, you stop, so when the show on the air stops. Your series doesn't have to stop, it can go on. Your characters can keep on living, and then the viewers can keep on interacting with the characters or exchanging information with their networks or their social networks about this or that character while the show is, uh, is not on. So your, your series can, can live 24 hours per day. Uh, and then when you're looking on the mobile, when you're in the subway or in the bus, then you're much more ready to engage in a conversation than when you're sit sitting in your, uh, in your living room. So the thing is, you need to adapt your, your, uh, the media, you, the, the content you show to the, to the position the viewer is in, is in. So if he's in the living room, then you provide this experience. If, it's in the, if the viewer is in his classroom, then you provide this experience. If the viewer is in the bus, then you provide that experience. So you need to adapt it. But the key thing is, your content is alive 24 hours a day, and it, maybe the, you will lose control of your content, uh, but uh, it's alive 24 hours a day, and your brand is alive 24 hours a day. So that's uh, creating a lot of opportunities. Talk about that in the context, and we're gonna take some questions in a second. Talk about that in the context of content. Let's just mention, to mention content, Bob, for those who don't know, there's this show that has become this phenomenon on MTV in the US, Jersey Shore. 
And it, if you're not familiar with it, it, it highlights the best and the brightest from, from the state that I happen to live in. Uh, <laughs> but really, how does that, how does a show like that, or does it, does it play to other regions of the country? And you guys have this whole 360 thing. How do you, how do you change your, your programming and your marketing with content like that, uh, given the region and the platform? So, um, let's see, what's the short answer to this question? You know, Jersey Shore is one of a, a long line of um, call them reality based shows. Um, you know, anytime you produce a show and uh, you never know if it's going to work or not, um, that one is clearly working, going to a second season. We will be um, momentarily, in fact, exhibiting that uh, around the world on MTV. There's a slight delay in the broadcast window due to the need to localize the product, including dubbing and the like. And, and you know, when we localize key international series, candidly, some of them work, some of them don't. Um, in the UK, they tend to work better as a rule than, say, in India. Um, but, you know, in short answers, you never know, and it does provide a certain amount of the backbone. So, um, for better or worse, um, Jersey Shore will be coming uh, to all the MTVs in March. Hmm. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Now, part of that is ultimately a multi platform experience, too, because you know, building on, on the comment about people um, consuming product differently. And by the way, I think that's the short answer. Some people want to like sit back and watch it on their TV and they just want to tune to a channel and that's it. And some people want to be far more engaged. And so, you know, you have to recognize that you provide product to a diverse set of consumers. And diversity means a lot of things, including, you know, technical proficiency and, and appetite for interaction. Um, and so in the case of all our key franchises, we do take them 360. And by the way, the other thing I'd say about 360 is, you know, and we're doing this in the music space, we launched a, um, a, a franchise called World Stage last year, which is every Friday night on MTV, you know, kind of live music. It's, you know, it's not live live, it's taped live. But, but the point of the matter is that is, you know, a, a, a worldwide experience. Um, they tend to be, uh, they are all leading international acts, they're not all American acts. Um, and that also is sort of a multi-platform experience, including a, a physical experience where we do festivals around, you know, bringing bands to people, involving sponsors, et cetera. So, you know, when you say 360 in this crazy digital world, don't forget the importance of doing something actually that you can physically touch. Right, right. That is very much part of 360. And, and ultimately, again, because different people engage with content differently, you have to have a multitude of extensions and you got to knit them back and, and you got to deal with the social networks for marketing them and, and all this stuff kind of goes into the sauce. Right. Dr. Roy, I want to, I don't know if, do we have any questions? Is there a microphone for questions or I don't know what the process is? And, and while we get that question, if there is a microphone, Dr. Roy, M&A activity, what, are, what sort of opportunities are there in India right now? Are there things coming down the pike? The word has been out there of it, an NDTV deal with Time Warner, uh, Turner Broadcasting, I think specifically. We don't mind if you break that news here. <laughs> Unfortunately, that news is already broken. Yeah, it's on the wires. It but, is. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a very strong capital market there. And uh, as you said, there's a huge interest internationally coming into the media sector. So there's a lot of activity going on right now. It's great. Are there questions? Yes. They're right over here. Raise your hand so he can see you with the microphone. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Lara Sadrakin with ABC News. I'm a correspondent for one of the old media stalwarts. And I actually have a basket of questions, if you'll indulge me, Brett. Uh, how do you assess the commercial value of news? What is it worth? Is the market price falling? Where do you see it stabilizing? And what's your theory on how to monetize news? And I'm fascinated to hear what Dr. Roy, but also our colleagues in entertainment and corporate have to say about That's that. That's a great question. Dr. Roy? Well, it's, um, it's a tough question, and, and it, it does very much depend on which sector. For example, in the Hindi news sector, which is the largest spoken language in India, uh, there are many news channels, and we had to face a, a, a trend which was very disturbing for us. Everybody went completely tabloid. At 9 o'clock, instead of the news, you'd see 
hidden cameras of a husband beating a wife, and that would go on for one and a half hours, and we'd be doing politics and international affairs, etc. And the advertisers, unfortunately in India, and CEOs don't watch Hindi channels. They speak English. So they just look at the numbers. So they don't distinguish uh, qualities of products. So they just go by the numbers. So for three years, those who went tabloid and got bigger eyeballs didn't lose in terms of advertising, while those who stayed uh, to solid journalism lost in eyeballs and didn't gain. But it took three years. Now, three years later, advertisers don't want to see their product associated with sex and violence. Like, like you have all over the world, you have uh, the Times and you have the Sun. The Sun may have many times the readership of the Times, but the Times have much higher advertising value. So the distinction in the market has now begun to happen with advertisers, and so we're getting like four times the rates of a tabloid channel. So to, to create value in news, I think you have to stick with credibility, and you will have short-term problems. And you just got to not weaken uh, when those numbers come out, eventually you're looking at revenues, not at eyeballs. And if you, if you stick to a credible, solid channel, you'll get higher revenues in the long run. Sure. Nuri. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, the value of the news is actually a derivative of the political conjuncture in the country. Uh, Turkey, which is a politically very volatile country, and every morning we start with a news agenda. Around 11 o'clock we dump it, and around 3 o'clock we have to redo it, and the prime time news is totally different from what we, where we started. And when I launched the very first news channel in 1997, everyone was laughing at me. They were saying, where are you going to find audience for that, where are you going to find news enough for 24 hours? Today in Turkey we have 15 news channels and more or less everyone is covering the same thing with the different tones, etc. And despite the fact that uh, regulation-wise you are not allowed to have commercial breaks within the news. News is the news and religious broadcast and children's programs are the three categories in Turkey where you are not allowed to have commercial breaks. But still, at the beginning, at the end, and somehow when you manage to sneak it in, uh, the news get good uh, commercials. So everyone is rushing in to do the news because the political environment is very volatile. I mean, but I reckon in uh, the Scandinavian countries, news wouldn't be of terrible interest where life is moving like a slow river and uh, everything is very stable and there's nothing to write about. <laughs> One more question. Question? We have the microphone coming up. Yeah, I have a question to Mr. Bakish. Given the success of MTV around the world with the adaptability of the concept, how would you evaluate uh, the success of MTV Arabia, given that it beams out of Dubai, and how do you see it moving forward, the presence of Rotana and now the, the, the partnership with, uh, with the News Corp company? So MTV Arabia is a relatively new product. Uh, it's free to air in the region, um, done in partnership with our, our licensee here. I think it's a good example of a localization of MTV. If you look at, at what's on air, obviously you see um, a different musical lineup than you would see in, in Mumbai. Um, and you would see um, international franchises, including something like a Maid, where we did locally specific versions for the region. Um, so on that level, I think, um, you know, it is a step forward in terms of um, increasing the entertainment offerings for this most important uh, region of the world. Um, like other MTVs, I would say, continues to be a work in process. Uh, you know, we continue and, and, and the local teams continue to work on programming mixes and the like, um, just like they do in Mumbai and just like they do in London. Uh, and so, you know, I think the, the, the critical thing is... Um, as we said earlier, you know, we, we were internationalists very early on. And by the way, the reason that was was not only because we could be, but that was because our management believed in being an international company and therefore made it a priority and committed you know, capital and, and, importantly, management time to getting that done. We continue to be big believers in international. 
Um, you know, I don't believe the future is running uh, a linear television screen in the United States. The future is, is, subverse, is serving the diverse population of the world through a combination uh, of local services. And, and, and the future is also very much about continuing to provide and grow, at least I believe, our, our participation in, in this market. And you saw us announce um, that we're doing um, something around Comedy Central uh, out of um, Abu Dhabi. Um, and as you say, we continue to operate MTV and Nickelodeon, for that matter, um, through our partnerships uh, out of Dubai or through our licensees. Um, and you know, we will continue to um, grow our business here. Um, and uh, you know, we will do it in a culturally sensitive way because ultimately, you know, you have to adapt your product. Um, that that is certainly one of the hallmarks. You heard that um, said earlier. That's a perfect place we have to wrap. It's so short. Any other comments on this region, though? Certainly coming on the hills of Rupert's uh, announcement of his investment in the area. Does anyone else want to comment on the opportunities here in this area from your perspective? Uh, one thing, for example, we found that, uh, again, the Turkish cities are working marvelous in this region. Three years ago, we discovered that uh, the audience in Arab countries would be very interested in the Turkish series. And now our exports Turkish drama series to this region uh, is reaching around five and a half million dollars, which is doing very well. And uh, this is, an, because Turkish is not a language which is spoken in this part of the world, it's usually dubbed. And encouraged by this uh, additional interest in this region, we pushed forward with the Turkish series in the Balkans, and we're getting very positive response from Bulgaria, Romania, and Serbia, where they're doing additional. So this is something hitherto unthinkable. Where that goes back to the, your first question, where the money is. Yes. Uh, for the money, you really have to go a long way and experiment, try, test, and see where you can find the buck. And certainly for you guys, get outside of your borders when you control 50% of the media within there. The growth opportunities are outside, right? Well, I, I mean, the, we have ex expanded uh, to such a degree in Turkey that uh, additional expansions would have caused allergies, yes. which already has. So <laughs> we're looking for Actually, other opportunities have, uh, abroad. We have a lot of synergies here because uh, there a, a large Indian population here. And creativity here, the, the partnerships we have are not just in media. Creativity goes into software and technology. So we have uh, a, lo a big presence here. For example, we had a young group of kids who came in who have now written an algorithm that this technology innovation where you can have live video streaming on an ordinary mobile, non-3G, and it's broadcast quality. And our guys, we're getting rid of OB vans. We're replacing OB vans by a six inch by six inch box. And we did it at Davos. It created a huge stir, stir and it worked brilliantly. So innovation technologically goes with media these days. You just can't separate the two, and we're doing a lot of that in this region. This is great. Thank you so much. These gentlemen will be around more today, so hopefully you'll get a chance to talk more. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.